Uh, it's all, all right. Hello, everybody, and thank you for coming for the first, hopefully, weekly Mixing Mondays. I'm not Nathan. <laughs> I'm using Nathan's account. For those who don't know me, I'm Scott Vogel, and my co-host is Liam. And I'm just going to start with saying what the whole point of these Mixing Mondays are. Liam and I are, we do not claim to be experts. This is we claim to be people who at least have some idea what we're talking about. But the whole idea of what Mixing Mondays is, it's not to replace office hours, it's not to re replace any of the various things that some of the other people in this network do. We're not on a stage saying, we know more than you. This is literally a round table discussion. That's what this would look like if we were all in the same room. All Lee and I are at this point, we are just kind of moderators of it. So, and we encourage people to chat. If you feel like, oh no, maybe, nope, we want you to talk. This is kind of what inspired from what happened at the Life Sound Summit was there were so many great topics, love, like, oh, we want to talk more, but there was only so much we could do and there was just so much going on. So this, this is the role this is going to play on that. So Liam, would you like to go first or would you like me to go with my first topic? I think you should uh, continue with your first talk since you, you seem to be on a roll. All right, so how this will format for now will work. We'll see what happens. It's basically, there will be four main topics we'll cover during this whole Mixing Mondays. Each, Liam and I each have picked one topic that is cover that we saw at the Live Sound Summit that we feel would definitely be worth a conversation. Then we each have another topic that we feel needs to be discussed but wasn't covered there or kind of latched onto it but didn't have a presentation. So I'm going to start with Ken Pooch's whole presentation. And just to give everyone a reminder about some points that he covered, his whole bit of how he got to where he was is that he communicates. And one of the things that stuck in my head was use a handshake, not talk back when you first meet the artist. So I think kind of let's just start on that. For me personally, I've always initially done handshake because I'm usually in the smaller scale scenarios where Either I'm the A1, but also helping the band load in and all this. So instinctually meeting them that way has been it. By the time I even pick up a talkback mic, the band's about set up at this point. But I kind of want now to open it to the floor of like, have any, did anyone else have an aha moment or that? Or be like, wow, I was kind of, this might have been why the band wasn't really communicative. So floor is now open. Yeah, I've definitely had experiences in the past where I've kind of been, I've, I've spent a morning uh, setting up a PA and ringing out wedges and things, and then I've just sat myself behind the desk, wait for some guys to arrive. Um, then a band's come in and sat there, and I've made, I've, I've made sort of no effort to go and say hello to them, and it's definitely hindered the rest of my day. Um, you know, it, it, it's got me off on the wrong foot a few times. So it's it's definitely a good idea to, from what I've, from my experience, to, you know, go and, go and make yourself known, I think. And even in a situation where you're not, like, the engineer, you know, like, I do a, a few shows a year where there's, like, just a ton of people on stage, a lot of, like, stage managers or, like, you know, third assistant to the assistant producer or whatever. And like, I find that so many of the musicians are so comforted when you come over and introduce yourself and you're like, if you need anything, I'm your person, like making that bond, you know, even if you are just like plugging in their guitar or whatever, it really helps them feel comfortable. Yeah, I think if you want to work in a friendly place, it starts with you, right? Like you have to go and create that environment around yourself. And you're right, going to musicians and getting off on the right foot probably will make the difference in your own enjoyment of the day. Ah, uh, Phil's with us. Hi, man. Yeah, uh, I to totally agree, Steve. Come on, Phil. You uh, uh, don't seem like you're shy in, in speaking to people. What's your approach if you're working with uh, a new artist or a new act and you, you're meeting them for the first time? I think I agree with what, uh, was it Kim or Steve said about being the, being the friendly person. If that's the atmosphere or the environment you want to work in, then it starts with you. And I, I always try and be like that. So 
Yeah. Yeah. I was listening from the start. I was just making a coffee, you know, because <laughs> that was a bit more important. Yeah. So, I, res- I respect the priorities. I really do. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I've, I've gone with uh, some cherry Pepsi Max today. So, I, no, I know, so Alish is nice and healthy with his glass of water. Yeah, I'll no straight coffee. vodka. I mean, <laughs> yeah, could be. No <laughs> cork anyone... bottle today, though. Anyone else kind of want to weigh in on this? Just this little idea of use a handshake, not a talk back for the first interaction. Um, I had a teacher once that said that, like, if you use someone's name, they'll immediately like and trust you. So, like, even in a situation where there's tons of band members, I always have, like, a cheat sheet where I write down all their names. Um, And then when we're on the talk back, I'll say, like, hey, Jeff, I'm ready for you or whatever, rather than just, like, bass guitar. And it always seems to make them way happier. (laughs) I actually do something similar if if my board allows me to fit in the characters, I will actually name them, be like, you know, Jeff guitar, Dan drums, just so, because that still, does, I will sometimes also use the paper one, but just having the immediate, I'm like, oh, I need the bass. Oh, Jeff. So Jeff, can you turn down a little bit? Or like, you're sounding up, you know, yeah, that, but that same idea of like, just naming. And I've, I've had people who'd be like, why do you name them? I'm like, because that way I can easily communicate because I'm horrendous with names. <laughs> About names too, and I always first thing I do whenever I'm on tour and I have to go and meet people for the day, select the manager, tour manager, whatever. Like if someone's providing a PA or something or something, I always just come out with my phone in the morning. You know, if I have only had one copy and haven't had my three copies, I need to talk to something. You know, <laughs> like I've always just write them people things. Like uh, Scott, you're kind. You're really low in. My computer's messed up. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll just kind of copy that. Bit. What you were saying, it seemed, if I, from what I heard, you were just saying it's like, yeah, you could kind of do the same thing on like first day of tour, where you kind of try and meet everybody and get the name. If that's kind of the gist of what I got, Scott. All right, cool. Um, anyone else kind of want to chat in on this? I got a whole bunch more on that. So don't feel like, oh man, it's the only going to talk about that. Like, no, I, I got plenty of more notes on, on the pooch one, but if everyone Name feels tags. like- uh, <laughs> Oh man. If I, can, if I can jump in, uh, if you know that you are going to be on a busy tour, um, just like use a name tag and put your name on it. I mean, it's, it's just, one that you know one little thing that can make everybody remember your name and that can be also crucial in the networking department like you know people who want to work with you will remember you because you shoved your name in their face for three days in a row and that's probably the only thing that might they might remember from that gig so you know if it's a busy gig if you don't have time to do rounds if you know that this is like a festival situation and bands are coming in and you don't have, I mean, even if you have the time to make the rounds, but you know, when you shake hands with six people in the row, by the time you get to the third one, the first one will forget what you said, you know, especially if you have weird characters in your name, like I do. <laughs> so um, yeah, name tags work, they work wonders. It's a bit different for me because my background is all musical theater. Um, and lately more corporate but I find when I was doing like say mic fittings on actors I would always start with the handshake because you don't kind of want to just go up to them and and be like okay we're going to put your mic here and and just go straight in with all the stuff you definitely want to start with a handshake ask how they are Um, but that's in an environment too where there's more time there's a lot more time you get like at least the theatre I used to work in you get like 20 minutes or so to fit microphones and and that kind of stuff. But um, one of the elements of feedback I got too was through a show run, which would normally be anywhere from four weeks to three months. The actors were always praising me that I would check in with them all the time. They were like, you always check in, you make sure we're hearing things correctly, that we're happy. And I, I think that goes back to what uh, Steve was saying about making the environment comfortable for the artist, right? Um, that's always the approach I try to go with. Anyway. Yeah, no, I also kind of to kind of jump off what you said, Phil, in my experience too, if anyone again wants to 
to about anyone other's conversation go right ahead. Um, I did a production of the producers about a, two or three years ago. And I also had to mic up everybody, but like certain people, like I had this rapport with like, um, one of the actresses names was, was Shirley. So every single time we would start quoting, you know, Shirley, you can't be serious. I am and don't call me Shirley, but just this idea of like, you're a person, not just, oh, it's the sound guy or sound girl or whoever, but just knowing it's like, hey, hey, it's Sky, you know, hey, we got this rapport. And also mentioning on the theater aspect, which is one of the, they're, you know, each has their advantages and disadvantages of theater versus bands. But one thing I like about, I always like doing musicals is because there's more days, but there's also usually set meeting times for the most part, you can then have the introduction. And I've asked the directors or the stage manager, like, hey, can I just have a minute or two before a rehearsal just so I could be like, hey, everyone, I'm Scott. I'll be doing sound. If you have sound questions or issues, come to me. And I always found that immediate communication of like, oh, that's who the guy or gal is not just, oh, who's that person up in the dark tower with the, with the board that does weird things? I think, uh, can you guys hear me better now? Is this, yeah. Okay, yeah, sorry. Got my actual microphone plugged. Okay. Um, now I think like with music stuff and people like getting into, people always ask like, how do you get into touring? How do you get your first tour if you're interested in doing that sort of thing? And I think it's also, I think it's a lot of times working at a venue and being nice to the band, you know, going up and make, being personable and treating them like understanding that they might be a little nervous being on stage or, or whatever. Or they might, you know, trying to accommodate them and help them out and acting like you're just being friendly and calling them by their names. I mean, it goes a long way and someone remembering you and maybe taking you on tour if that's, you know, if they need somebody. So I think it's, it's always helpful to, call people by their names it'd be nice you know yeah there's nothing worse than being like hey um guy or girl on the bass could you just play for me definitely don't want to do that yeah it's a where it's like a you know it's a service industry uh, ultimately you know trying to like work to get on a team to make make a good show happen but you're also trying to like help the musician get their show going you know help the artist get their show going because it's really about the experience of the show so you know, when someone feels like you're on their team, they, they're going to have a better show and the whole, whole thing will be better, better for everybody. Yeah, I've been really lucky. I, uh, I left, as a few people already know, uh, I left full-time theatre work, ven venue staff uh, this January and moved into freelance and uh, immediately jumped into a, a month of work in France and Switzerland, but it was with a band that I'd already worked with. Uh, so I knew all of those guys really well, crew and, and band members. So, so far this year, I've been exceptionally lucky. Um, straight after that, I went to Germany with a, a different band, which I, I had met once. Uh, but only because they came through our venue with their show. Uh, so I kind of knew their faces, but not their names. Um, but yeah, for the for that first trip out, it was it was made a lot easier for me. Um, so yeah, I was I was quite lucky because I'm I'm terrible. Scott, you were just saying there that you you love to be able to take the opportunity to say, "Hi, I'm Scott. I'll be doing sound." I, I hate all that. I you know. It's one of the things I like about being behind the sound desk is that I can I can not talk to people. Well, that's just me. I'm antisocial. Is that because you're British and miserable? Yeah, <laughs> and northeast British as well. <laughs> it's terrible. I've actually got um because uh, the small company that I run is in in Newcastle, in the northeast, and um there's a bit of an in joke among my clients that we're the only happy PA hire company. Um, and, I, and I think that just comes from, uh, particularly me, if I'm nervous, I smile or I laugh. And that's, I think a lot of people just kind of go, oh, you're always smiling on a gig. It's like, oh, I can't remember your name. So I just kind of smile and nod. Um, but it seems to work for us. Yeah, that kind of is an interesting thing. Like there's this annoying and I hate it in running joke with like my sponsor. Like we'll talk about because I'll also be so hugely happy. It's like, well, you're supposed to be a miserable stagehand. I'm like, says who? what law got passed that I didn't get told that I have to be miserable. Yeah. Like we all have our bad days, but I'm like, I follow what Joseph Campbell says, follow your bliss. And I love doing this. Yeah. We all have our things, but it's like, 
And that also seems to, when people are like, wow, they'll, they'll almost be surprised. It's like, wow, you're enjoying doing this? I'm like, yeah, I, I want to do this. So and I think that does help too. Like what you said, Elliot, is like oftentimes when you're in a good mood, for the most part, it also helps everyone else be in a good mood. So which I think would be... Oh, I was just going to say, we used to have a joke that like, if you wanted to be miserable, you could probably be miserable at a higher paying job. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It's. Um, I if you don't mind me, um, sorry. If you don't mind me sharing a, a bit of a longer story about this, um, last year, I was um, I was hired to be a system engineer for a touring theater company that came to Slovenia from Saint Petersburg in Russia, and we later found out that this was the first performance the entire company had done outside of their theater and their structure of command or the chain of command was so rigorous that the main producer um who was a, a fierce woman that everybody like really was afraid of um ran such a tight ship that nobody would um, argue with her to the point of actually endangering the show. And that meant that when they came here, everybody was like scared to the umpteenth level. And I got there in my cheery old, you know, mood and saw that everybody was like, you know, grumpy faces and everybody was swearing in Russian and which makes it worse for some particular reason. And I just kept whistling because I don't know if, if you've noticed, but you can't whistle if you're grumpy. Like you can only whistle if you're in a good mood, right? You can't go, ah, oh, right? So um, I kept whistling like for the entire day. I was you know, cheering everybody on. Nobody would understand what I'm saying because there were like only two translators and I was talking to stagehands who didn't know a word of English. I didn't know a word of Russian, but you know, I was smiling and cheering and whistling and whatever they needed, you know, hand gestures. And I would, you know, place that monitor 15 times across the stage because somebody said, hey, it's out of the way or like show that, you know, this is whatever, not working for them. And I did it like for the entire day. And then, and then the next day I started getting noticed as the guy who whistles, right? So everybody sort of started coming around and just seeing me in my whistling mood, it sort of brought smiles to their faces and they were there for 10 days. And by the end of those 10 days, like the entire crew was, Hey, how you doing? And I'm like, Hey, my Russian friends. And nobody still was speaking a word of each other's language, but and there was a mutual goodwill passed on. So don't be brought down by, by everybody else's misery, right? you can make that difference. And I saw that firsthand and it was a really, really eye-opening experience. And I still, to this day, have great friends from that, um, from that experience, which sort of came up, you know, through that chain of command up to the entire, the, the boss lady. And up until that point, everything was wrong. Like the, the sound wasn't good. And they couldn't tell me what was wrong, but the sound wasn't good. And I was just, you know, tweaking stuff. And even after like we, we did four or five shows and even after like the, the fourth show, nothing, nothing was working. Like, I mean, the sound was great in my opinion, but they said, yeah, yeah, uh, chef cannot happy. That was their, that was their uh, response to everything. So the boss is not happy. Right. And so on the final day uh, of the final show, um, I went to this ice cream parlor and bought ice cream for everybody, like two giant tubs and said, okay, tech crews, directors, composers, whoever, like two tubs of ice cream we are sharing. Um, and when the, when the, the boss lady saw that, that she came around and she, she went around telling everybody how much she liked sound 
which was sort of, in her opinion, now way better than what they had in their own theater. And magically, lo and behold, I was now the guy who uh, did the magic sound and everybody came to me and said, hey, they're like best sound ever. And, you know, the only thing that, that made that possible was like, a, like two tubs of ice cream and three days of whistling. So um, I'm pretty certain that whenever they come around to this part of Slovenia or this part of Europe, they might remember me. They might not, but it will be the experience of lifting somebody's spirit just by being your cheery self. If you can do that for a couple of people on the show or on tour, man, I think you're golden. Alex, thank you so much. And that, that actually, that story is a great segue into another bit where Pooch was talking about reading the situation. And, but I do want to mention where you bring in the ice cream. I have in the past, um, I live in Vermont and one of the places we have um, is this place that makes apple cider. And now I'm not talking alcoholic. It's, I guess we could call it soft apple cider. It's literally apples crushed up, tastes delicious. Uh, I basically compare it to high quality apple juice, but I did a musical and long, on the way to get there, I would go buy this apple cider place. I bought a big gallon jug of it set it on like the refreshment table and like the stage stage manager was like oh wow thanks and she mentioned like at some point unsolicited she was like oh by the way everybody scott brought apple cider drink as much as you want and i also do things like we all now i don't know, have the time so learn how to make a simple chocolate chip or simple baked good recipe bring it to either production meeting or whatever won't guarantee, but man, it will increase the chances of people liking you if you brought some kind of food item. So, but three, the situation was another good example. And Pooch gives the example like, hey, you see me on tour, say hi. But if I'm neck deep in something, leave me alone. So I that's kind of more the tricky one. Like some of the stuff is easier, but that is tricky. I'll admit myself, I had a little bit for a long time picking up on some social cues, whether it be American, British, whatever, sometimes social cues can be a challenge, but I find as Alex, you've had a great example of reading the situation of sometimes knowing when to do things to kind of brighten things up, like perfect example, and then I'll open the floor up to people. I have a long, everyone has, you know, their two or three songs they check the system with. I have an entire QLab file that's about an hour and a half. We could talk at another point, but why I do that is so there's always kind of music playing and oftentimes the act will come in while they're setting up. And one act I did recently, I was playing a jazz tune and the guy was like, oh yeah, this tune. And then it already started a conversation because I was like, oh yeah, I played this song in jazz band. He's like, yeah, it's a really neat tune. So sometimes, not all the time, that can help just getting up, a have, knowing a situation. Now there's also times where I've also been aware so for some reason, the person does not like house music, and you unfortunately just have to play silence. But we'll kind of now let's just dive into that idea of knowing how to read the situation and experience is both good and bad. Come on, Elliot. I think I've got anything on that. No. Yeah. Um, I can jump in um, with a story that I was thinking about when you're talking about reading the situation. Like sometimes it can just be like tricky when you're working with a new artist or somebody like that. Like I did a tour in January where the artist was generally like in pretty good humor and like he liked to kind of talk about himself. Like he was like a fun, good time dude. But like a lot of times he just seemed like really intense in like a sound check rehearsal situation. But then afterwards, like if you were talking to him, he'd say like, oh yeah, it was a great sound check, had a great time, even though he was kind of like yelling his face off the entire time. And <laughs> two shows into the tour, like I'm kind of away from this whole situation out at front of house, but the guitar tech was just getting so beat down. Just like, man, the artist hates me. He's always yelling at me. He's always like telling me how something isn't right. Like I really think that I'm screwing it up and it's, you know, it's not going well. And it, like all he needed from me was just to be like, no, like, even though you're perceiving it that way, like the artist has told me that you're doing a great job. And like that just totally turned around his whole tour. And it can be so hard. Like I think artists are especially difficult to read. Like sometimes intensity can read as 
unhappiness or anger. And it's really just that they care a lot about what's going on, you know? And like, it sucked that that tech <laughs> read it as I'm going to get fired. <laughs> and he needed, he just needed a, a lift. That's really interesting, Kim. I think, I think well, I'm, I'm big into mental health. You might have noticed from Live Sound Summit when, when um, I've forgotten that lady's name, but she did her presentation on it. That sounds like a confidence issue to me uh, with, with that person. Um, yeah, yeah, I just wanted it was, to point that out. It was out. his first tour as a tech and not a set carpenter. So it's his first time like being on a one-on-one, -on -one, like I'm the artist dude. And it just sucked to see like every single day just... <laughs> it was rough it was really hard to watch but he did a great job and eventually it all worked out but man he had a hard time you know if you just look for opportunities to give people sincere compliments when they're deserving of it i think that goes a, a huge long way um it's like you got to be sincere but but you can find those opportunities if you look for them and it can change like your interpersonal relationships and the, the dynamic that you're working on really a lot. And it's actually quite fun to look for that and, and to like, you make them feel good, but you feel so good accomplishing that, you know? Yeah. That's a good story, Kim. Yeah. I feel like a lot of times artists are just too wrapped up in their own world to really just say the compliments, even if they're feeling that way. So yeah, definitely. I've been on tours where, yeah, throwing a compliment here or there definitely like lifts the mood of the crew in general or, it doesn't take much. It just takes, you know, yeah, think, thinking of something nice to say and saying it. It's, it's uh, just a win-win, a right? Yeah, I've had similar situations where, like, what, or whether it be musicals or things that were multi-day things, if I observe, like, for example, when uh, there was a touring came through, I was more on wardrobe. It was of uh, waiting. And I was just more on the low end of the spectrum of the, of the tier for it, but it was one of the like minor characters, but he had just had this comedic bit. And it just, that night, it just floored me. I was like, when he came off stage and we did our thing, I was like, dude, that was absolutely hilarious. And it just seemed to like brighten his mood just a little bit. So it's a, the, the power of just a small little compliment, whether it be with a musician or whatever, can have great power. Um, anyone else kind of want to weigh uh, in on this? Oh. I also do want to say though, as far as like reading the moment, like it's not always the right time for a compliment if you're talking to an artist especially if, if they're in the like they're almost always in the middle of something some people like a, especially when artists are getting a lot of press going up with them or, or the tours are getting to a certain level or they're, they're getting famous there are a lot of people asking time asking of their attention and stuff and you don't want to like get into that you don't want to interrupt them when they're spoke, trying to focus on something else because you'll just be another person that's trying to demand their attention I think waiting for the right time to give a compliment is 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 as important as giving a compliment. You know, like yeah, like thank you. Like, yeah. Sorry, go on. No, I just you know thank you, Scott, on that. A good other side of the equation of it, perfectly as valid as the giving one. I think as well going back to what Scott's just been saying, um, you kind of got a. And this was another thing that Pooch had said, so you're probably going to get onto this yourself, Scott, but um, it was about telling telling very sort of, not blunt, but being very truthful with people. Um, and, you know, compliments, compliments do come across great as long as they seem sincere. Um, I think if you're just coming across as someone who's complimenting an, an artist because you want them to feel better, then it's going gonna, it's gonna to show. Um, and that's probably something, it's a, it's a tricky line to walk because you don't want to avoid giving them compliments. Uh, this goes for artists or, or, or anyone else, I suppose. Um, but you, you don't want to avoid that, but you also don't want to feel like you, you're just constantly, you know, patting someone on the back. I suppose you've just got to, you know, do it honestly and be honest in, in the other direction as well. You know, if, if someone says, do you think, uh, I can't remember, Pooch's example was something like, you know, do you think that guitar solo worked? If you don't think it did, say so. Um, but yeah. yeah. And that kind of, both Scott and Liam, you kind of bring up the idea of, especially when you're getting 
to like the higher level, like double, triple A artists. They have so many yes people around them. Like uh, Robert Scoville has this great story about when he worked with Prince, where now that I'm just gonna say on the side note, talking about Prince and like on the backstage, that's all that could we could talk all day about all the sides of it. But for this example, I think in Nathan's interview with him, he talked about where how Prince would sometimes do things and, and demand, not demand, for lack of a term, demand some things from people as a test to see if they were a yes man. And Robert, who at this point had all, all this experience, like one day Prince was like, oh, let's completely remove, I think it was, let's move like 180, the PA or some ridiculous thing. You're like, that's gonna take all day and all this. And Robert just goes to Prince, he goes, we can't do that. We don't have the time. And Prince went, okay, cool. So while well, Prince, an example is a very deep one, but just that idea of also knowing when not to be the, the yes person. Sometimes and I'm all, and I understand the power of sometimes having to say yes to things, but sometimes you have to go, no, we can't do that. Shows in 10 minutes, we can't add a whole, you know, new instrument to this thing. We don't have the time, no one's, but also knowing having, but the key of it is also understanding when you have to say that no in that scenario, give a damn good reason why because if you just say no that could also be your last day so it's also I, I think you know if you're I've talked to artists before where I, I remember saying no to somebody and it was about like an, maybe trying an artistic thing you know like when someone's trying to you know not asking you to do something with the PA or something but like to try something I remember saying no and I remember like getting like a reaction like, oh, really? Well, you need to be trying this because I'm paying you sort of thing. Um, so I think it's like, you know, it's depending on what you're really discussing um, is, is important to think about too. I mean, I, I almost always say yes if it's someone's asked me to try something that might better the show, you know, um, at least in an art, artistic mixing type of way, even though sometimes I don't want to do it, you know. Yeah, I've been in a similar situation as, and again, it's that whole idea of reading the situation. It's like, where it's where something is like, hey, mind if I just try this different guitar? Sure, you know, I'll take just another minute. But like knowing when you can be able to say yes is definitely very important. So um, unless someone, I'm just gonna give one, does anyone else wanna kind of talk on the read the situation moment? Because I'm kind of wanna segue into a different subtopic within his presentation. If anyone else has anything else on this. All right, seeing that there isn't anything, kind of now to switch a little bit more on the technical side. So it's just not all like social, which is still very important, but um, which he got to what were the four fundamentals or as he liked to call it, what is baked into the cake, which as are, uh, they are mic choice, mic placement, high pass and low pass filter, proper gain structure and balance. Now I'm gonna start with first just out of order. One that in that one blew my mind was, mic placement, because he uses the example, we've all been there on a smile and dial show, like 10 minutes into the show, we're like, oh crap, 3K is just ripping everyone's head off and you immediately reach for the EQ and take it out. But then sometimes there are scenarios where we have no choice, but it's like, if, and he was also very passionate and about being, take the moment, get someone on, you know, on comm if you can, or during sound check, move the mic so that that, issue just goes away so for me i was just like when we finally get all back to doing what we do it's like duh it's one of those why not focus you know garbage in garbage out if you make the sound source sound good less eq because eq while it can be used right if you don't have to use it and you can make the source sound good without it why use it so kind of well let's just talk on the four fundamentals concept yeah, I, I read, um, it was either earlier today or yesterday, I was reading a, an article on Pro Sound Web, uh, and it was Jim Jim Yakavusi, who, he's, he's done all kinds of people, um, and he was talking about something very similar, and it's it's the, the habit that a lot of people have to multi-mic sources or turn sources into multiple inputs whether it's multiple mics or a mic and a di um and again he he was bringing back that same question where is it always worth it is it you know because if you're going to run into 
uh, phase problems for the sake of trying to look clever. Um, you, you know, you, you're, you're better off just going with the mic or the DI or just one mic rather than dual mic in a guitar cab. Um, so yeah, I mean, he was, he was going through a couple of things briefly. It was only a, a small, like two sort of half page article, um, about timing. He, he mentioned, uh, kick in, kick out mics and changing, uh, a delay time so that they're not necessarily uh, timed perfectly but using the delay times to actually tune uh, effectively the crossover um, but yeah I think I think there's a lot of times there's whether it's a case of picking a, a different microphone or uh, using only one microphone and starting from the source end there's often a lot of more simple ways of solving a problem than sitting at the console and just hacking away at your EQ or, or trying to fix things with compression or, or anything else that you've got at the console end. So there's definitely something, there's something see, in it. I see a lot of that. Like I do more corporate events now than theatre and the amount of times I've seen like perhaps I'm not doing audio, maybe I'm doing video or something, and I see an operator who's put their speakers up for a corporate event. Let's say they just point source on sticks and they have someone checking on stage, speaking into a microphone, they're often lapels. And the EQ is just ridiculous. They've got a graphic EQ on the, let's call it a main left and right. Let's just say it's a left and right. They have a graphic EQ on there and they've, taken their input EQ as well, a parametric, and they've just hacked the way at it. And it just makes no sense. It mm -hmm. clearly the issue is because this, your speakers are not in the right place. Perhaps your mic placement is wrong. You need to move your speakers. You need to move your mic. You need to do both. But there's a tendency to just go straight for the EQ, hack yeah. it all away, bring the level up, which doesn't really make any sense. Um, yeah, and I, I see it loads. It's weird. When I EQ, I'm sure it's the same for everyone else. The the minor cuts, and I, I try to not use a graphic if I can avoid it. Um, sometimes it's necessary. You're talking maybe four to six bands, that's it, at most. But I try not to, because I know the, the issue is just because the speakers are not in the right place, or the mics yeah. aren't in the right place, or both. I think for some people as well, there's a an ego issue where... Uh, Maybe starting with something so fundamental as speaker placement or microphone placement seems like something where they just think, oh no, I can't have made a mistake that simple and try to fix it with something that seems a little bit more uh, technical or, or um, you know, something a bit more impressive rather than something fundamental. Um, and I think even, even people that are just starting to learn I mean, I'm, I'm the same. As soon as I start to try and learn anything, if I'm reading the first page of how to do whatever, I, I'm getting bored on them first few pages and I want to skip ahead to the interesting things. But it just seems to be, um, you know, people want to be there doing... And there's there's a, a place for all of the, you know, double micing and parallel compression and, and some more, more advanced techniques. But... A lot of people just don't want to start at the beginning and work their way through. They kind of want to jump ahead, which I can understand, but it doesn't really help you in the end. I just uh, wanted to add one, one fundamental thing that I think you can add to those uh, four uh, things that Pooch mentioned, and that is the try fixing it in the source, if at all possible. So, you know, even microphone selection and placement won't won't help you if you have a wonky sounding snare. So if you can go up to the drummer and say, hey, maybe can we use like different sticks or can we tune the drum differently or can we do something else at the source? You know, um, most of the times that will be so such a huge difference than um, 
or a more obvious difference than changing the microphone or changing the mi microphone placement, right? So if you have like, like a guitar cap that is really annoying and nasal, whatever, just, you know, cuts through everything else, uh, try turning the knobs on, on the amp if, if the guitar player will let you, or, you know, try placing the amp differently or something that will fix the source as you are listening to it either on stage or you know in the recording booth it it's the same principle that's why you know we kept losing our hearing because we were listening to guitar caps at full volume and sticking our ears next to the the speaker trying to figure out where's the sweet spot on the amp right it's the same thing it's the same thing on the stage um if you can figure out if there's if there's an issue at the source and you can fix it at the source, you should do that. And I think that is one of the things um, that maybe gets overlooked uh, a lot of the times, but should probably be number one on the list, you know, go on stage. Or even if you, if you can't do that, like if there's, a, if there's a physical barrier between you and the stage and you can't go that, mute the PA system, try and listen whether or not that, you know, 3K is coming from the snare itself or if it's microphone or, or whatever it is, but you know, try listening to the source first. I must say though, um, even if I have like all my input sources sounding how I want them on stage and everything's coming in just fine, I still use a lot of EQ. Like, oh, yeah. Especially if I have a lot of instruments coming in, like I'm, I'm hack, especially on drums, hacking EQ quite a bit. But I mean, that's, that's me. That's how I do it, you know? And it works well for getting like pop drum sounds like, like a lot of the music I mix, you know? But, you know, it's still even, I feel like EQ shouldn't be the enemy. No, um, I, 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 no, I'm not. Oh, go on, sorry guys. It was just, and you make a very good point, Scott. And it was just more, as I'm just going off the presentation was, Pooch wasn't anti-EQ. He was just saying, first part, like again, he was using the cake metaphors, Definitely, he, in fact, has a whole bit on EQ. He's just saying, first, make sure it's good, and then use the EQ, not use it as the first bit is kind of what he was saying. And, but no, I totally agree. There's been cases where, especially when you have multi more and more inputs, I think, Alex, you even explained this in uh, your Gorilla Mixing, is the more inputs you got, the more chances you got to use EQ because you got so many frequencies trying to compete with each other. Um, so does kind of anyone else want to kind of weigh in on the pooches for and yeah i think I, I, what i what i meant was yeah i agree with scott as well adamson scott adamson like i well, both of you but i agree with what you're saying like yeah eq isn't isn't the enemy but i think using it to fix a problem that's easily fixed by just taking your speakers and going like that a bit further away from the stage and maybe moving the microphone from the belly button you know, to up here or whatever the issue might be, is that's a better option than hacking out all this EQ, which is going to mess up so many other things potentially. So, totally. Yeah. Yeah. And I can I can give you a, a practical example of that. Um, we do so half of the shows that we do are like large electric rock and roll shows, and the other half are like more intimate acoustic um stuff and then you know the, the 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 lead singer also plays an acoustic guitar and when he's placed a uh, stage center sometimes you know the pa whatever it is you can get like a low-end frequency buildup that sort of starts re resonating within the guitar itself um and you know instead of going you know, we'll pull this down with a graphic EQ or we'll notch this out with a parametric on the channel EQ. We just move the guy, like physically relocate him like three feet to the right or to the left. And then magically, you know, that disappears because we took into account like the physics stuff of it. And then the guitar still sounds full. It's not hacked away because we had to solve a problem. And I completely agree with, uh, with Scott A. Um, you know, use the EQ as much as you like, as long as it's a creative choice and not a problem solving um, um, necessity that you have to do, right? If, if you sort of run out of bands because you had to remove a lot of frequencies because stuff wasn't working in the first place, then 
there's nothing left for you to do when you actually have to remove the frequencies that you need to remove to place that particular sound within a mix. So, yeah. Yeah, awesome. And I, I, I think that going back to like getting the sound source just right, like practicing drum tuning is like a great skill for audio engineers. Um, I mean, I'm a drummer, I've been doing it forever, but like record, when I used to own a recording studio, that's like the skill that I best took away from the, from the studio. I think it was just like being able to get a drum really in tune. I got some of the bands I tour with, like the band Heim I tour with. I mean, I'm, a lot of times I'm tuning the drums to get them how I want them to sound. Um, and the drummer's like, you know, the drummer's a hired gun. So he's like, yeah, whatever you want to do. So I get my napkins out. I tape them up to make them sound like 70s style. And, but that's how I want them to sound. So it's always the best thing to do instead of, yeah. Well, I just got to kind of uh, jump off what you said too, is I have a little, I have a bag that literally is, if I'm working with, an act that I know has a band and or is a band it ha and what's in it is extra guitar strings drumsticks guitar cables and a thing of moon gel moon gel so yes very important that, I have most of the time but it's just knowing you have that because if you hit, hear that snare and you're like uh-oh you be like hey man I got a thing of moon gel use it yeah. and it, it's hard if you don't know the drummer you know but right. You know, but it's a, it's great to have the tools if, you know, because right. a lot of times people are like, oh, really? I, yeah, I want my snare to sound good. So I'm willing to tr try stuff. Yeah, and it's again, and kind of on the whole bit is, while well, this is kind of goes back to more read the situation is, and you're actually saying this, Lee and I were talking about something where there's this great clip and quote of Tom Cruise going, help me help you. So it's that whole idea is whenever you do need to approach a musician or artist or whatever, you're just kind of, going for the idea of I'm doing this not because I'm trying to be an asshole. I'm doing this for the ultimate goal of making everything sound better. And 99 times out of a hundred, I found that is the way you'll, you'll sometimes find that person who's like, I don't care. I'm not doing it. But if you give them the reason it's seems to increase the probability of they'll be like, Oh, cool. I'll give it a shot. I think that's, and, a, really, that's a really good point about, um, you know, we're on the same team as, as the artists. And I think especially, a lot of what I do is, is house stuff, so I don't know the band, you know, before or after that day. And when you sort of go, you know, do you mind if I just kind of give the drums a little go with one of those? And it's because if I'm not doing that at the moment, I'm having to EQ, gate it, compress it. So they're not getting their drum sound anyway. If you can kind of explain that in a way that I'm having to destroy this drum electrically and I'd rather just have it sound right so that the band sounds right, so that your kit sounds good out front. It's not like because... I hate you and your sound, you know? I'd be far, like, I'd have far too little confidence in my own diplomacy for that conversation. I think I'd, I'd probably trip myself up and say something horrendous. I'd yeah, probably I just walk, walk up with a drum tuning key and just sort of stare at them. Well, but, as with Scott, I'm a drummer, so that, that conversation does become a little bit easier if you're a musician and yeah. you can kind of look do you mind if I try this? And, you know, that's, that's generally how I phrase it. Or sometimes if I'm, if I'm the band, I go, do you mind if I destroy your snare drum with, with a drum key? And that usually gets a laugh and that, that'll work. That probably goes back to the beginning of the conversation where you're trying to be friendly and learn people's names. If you get yeah. that rapport going with them, it's a bit easier. Strike up a conversation about how long they've had the drums and where they're from and be genuinely interested. And, and that, that will lead to an easier path to, to getting it right when they see that you're on the same team. Like, yeah, that's, that's a right. really good point. Actually, in a lot of cases, I, I probably do it just because I'm, I'm interested rather than like as a, as a technique. But I do often, I will have already said, oh, is that, a, is that a 60s Ludwig that you're using? Or is that like, is that one of the new DWs? I haven't played with one of those yet. Or, you know, what's that guitar amp you're using? And that's just because I'm interested in, in gear and backline. And when people ask me questions, I like to, know the answer so i might as well ask somebody that's using it um, drummers and guitar players will talk about gear all day long so if you can facilitate yeah. that conversation they'll be all about it usually and if you're mic in the amp and you just kind of go like oh these, these cabs i know they're a bit funny sometimes like is there one speaker better than the other like it shows that you care i think early on and it doesn't take any time because you're already there doing it all. yeah and while we're on the sorry uh, Steve, that's why uh, so many drummers become sound engineers. It's just because you gotta love the gear, like geek out on mics and stuff. You know? 
and, and I think a lot of, like, I'm a drummer too. I've spent gazillions of hours putting mics in front of drums and I like doing it. <laughs> so, you know, people, it's an art form and, and people enjoy figuring that stuff out and working together. Drummers want their drums to sound good. When I was a drummer on tour years ago and an engineer who wasn't awesome came up to me and said, oh, I've got the drums sounding out front just like they sound on stage. And to me, that was like the most disappointing thing I'd ever heard. <laughs> I was like, I want to play cannons, you know? Yeah. Okay, just, you want, you want? Just, yeah, sorry. I'll just jump in on, um, on Leon's comment about like diplomacy and how to start a conversation. It doesn't have to be a statement. It can be a question like, um, hey, um, you know, are you, is this like uh, your regular sound of the snare or do you usually tune it higher, lower? How do you, how does it sound in the room? Like you, you can sort of get them on your side if you just like, ask them like honestly yeah. hey does this tom usually ring this long for you and they might say yeah like this is the best sounding drum ever and then you go okay i'll go downstairs and twiddle knobs but like 90 percent of the or 95 percent of the times um they will say yeah i mean could be better and then you can start from there it, let's let's try making it shorter let's try you can actually just do suggestions like on my end, this is what I'm hearing. What are you hearing on your end? So this can also be like an icebreaker for you, right? Yeah, I mean, before, before you said that, I was gonna go back to uh, guitars and back to what Scott Adams has said about EQ and I'm, I'm in no way anti-EQ. Anti I know some people are like purely pick the, pick the perfect microphone and, and leave it as it is, but I suppose kind of combining those two conversations but going back to guitarists is uh the fact that pete one of the things i hear people saying that they don't eq most often is guitar cabs which for me and this depends a lot on the scale of the band that you're playing with and where their amps are positioned but a lot of the time uh the tone of a guitar cab that's at the tone at microphone height is not the tone at the guitarist's head height. Now, if the tone they're going for is the tone at their head height, they're not EQing down at two foot off the floor, three foot off the floor, is is not being a purist and giving them the tone that they've spent months and years developing. It's giving them something that they're not hearing. So it's kind of counterintuitive. You've got to, and going back to what Alish said about uh, listening to the sources, if you can get yourself up on the stage and stand where the guitarist is, listen to it the way the guitarist is hearing it rather than standing off the front of the stage with the guitar cab pointing straight at your head, because it's going to sound totally different. You know, it's like, it's like being off axis to the front of house PA it's it doesn't sound the same so you you've got to you've got to know which you've got to know what you're listening for to begin with i think um, I, I ask guitar players i build a report and i ask them to to dial in the sound they want with their head in front of the cabinet and i explain to them that they're they're leaning over and they're completely off of access and most people are pretty receptive to that they haven't been mm. told that before they want a good sound and if you're sensitive to to that and work with them but, but but that's a game changer is getting them to dial in the sound with them more in front of the cabinet yeah because that's an issue i've seen guitarists both like big bands that everyone knows and little bands they seem to think their ears are in their knees or in their feet and i just go first of all why because i'm, I'm a guitar player myself and I always, I have a tab in fact here somewhere, one of those stands, or even before I owned one, like if my band I was in it was a gig, I actually used the keyboard stand because they're much higher than your guitar amp stands are because I want it right at my ears. So, but often when an amp, an act will come in and I realize, uh oh, they're going to be loud and not much I can do about it, I'll go to the guitar player and go, hey, we have guitar, uh, guitar amp stands. They'll either at least angle it 
or raise it up. So, which again kind of goes back to the idea of find it at the source. Uh, sorry, I kind of got lost on track of that, but just that idea of like, see, with working with the artist, and in my times I've ever done that, um, I think I've had one artist kind of forgudgeon about it, but it they went, oh, fine, okay. And they went with it. And but it was also one of them we asked that whole idea. It wasn't just, hey, we're going to do this. It was like, hey, do you mind the, even in this room right now, the way you have your amp, it's just blowing our heads off. So can we tilt it up? So again, giving the idea of why you're doing it happens. So now if, and no one, if no one doesn't mind, I think we, I might want to switch on another kind of, to me, topic that was really interesting on that. Does anyone else kind of want to talk about this part a bit more. If not, I'm going to switch to another part that Pooch talked about. All right, here, nothing. I'm kind of going to end on this one because I think we've talked about a good hour and I want to end on this one. Um, virtual playback, which is something that I've not unfortunately had. The, I've recorded a whole bunch of gigs I've done, but unfortunately, most of mine are, you know, smile and dials. You have you got one day and then you never see the artist again. But as I was re-listening to it, he, it's just the idea of use, uh, so you're using, for the, you do the big picture for sound check and then details after the band has left. And one idea that struck to me, like when we all get to resume doing this is like, oh, just do it on headphones. You're only using for the little details. You're not trying to see oftentimes if you have a luxury, you don't have it through the system. It's just like, go where you can go ahead of time going, oh, okay, this frequency is just in the microphones causing trouble and you can spend the time between doors and open to go oh okay there's where it is and you can find the little you know the frequency or just know oh, okay this will be an issue there that way in the middle of of um of the show you don't go what is causing that and you're like you now have to focus on that you can go hey by the way when show starts you know check to see this because this seems to be giving me issues so and I, for me, it's an idea. I love the idea of virtual playback and what it can do, both in terms of practicing at home while during this downtime, but also when gigs start up again. So I open the floor to everyone to talk about it or questions we want to discuss on it. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, multi-track recording anything I can that I work on in the future. I bought at the start of this lockdown, I bought myself a, an RME MADI face. So it's a, a MADI uh, to USB interface. Um, and I, I mean, I've been spending certainly the first half of the lockdown so far downloading multi tracks and using them for practice just to keep myself busy. Um, but as soon as, as soon as I get to go back to work, I plan on doing the same in reverse and, and actually recording things and using it for that very reason um because uh, you know you, d you don't always have the time to fix everything there and then you know it, if it's uh, it i suppose then it comes down to prioritizing uh what you fix straight away and what you you can leave and do with a recording um maybe the the more sort of artistic things can be left for uh, sitting with a recording, uh, you know, pl trying different reverbs, different delays, um, you know, may maybe a, a bit more difficult to uh, slap a, a, a new compressor on with a multi-track recording and, and, and not being able, especially if it's on something like a vocal that's going to be roaming around the stage, um, just because, you, you know, you don't know what that's going to do without a live mic on the stage. Um, especially with for anyone that's used them the 1176 uh compresses the cuz it, it's it's a, a sort of a gain in and a gain out and it's it's whereas with a compressor I I tend to sort of uh set everything and then just dial the threshold in so you're not going to get any nasty surprises and with the 1176 it's a bit more difficult to do that um so I'd always be I, I think I did I, I, I stuck an 1176 on something once in the middle of a show, uh, and not only was there an audio dropout because I was throwing a new plugin on, but it it it, it was horrendous or like feedback for for days. Um, so yeah, I mean the multi-track recordings are 
they're going to be a massive help for me for a lot of things. Uh, I just have to make sure that I'm doing, using them for the right things and not getting carried away. Yeah, I used a multi-track like virtual sound check for the first time on this tour that I did in January. Because usually what I'd been doing was just kind of one-offs or like venue sound stuff. In the tour, it was really cool to be able to use it. Like we were using in-ears for almost everybody. And then we had a couple wedges on stage, um, mainly for the artists. And it was so cool to play back the previous night's show because we had different wedges every day and have the signal from his mic, you know, that was the same and it's going to be the same to check like, what does this wedge sound like compared to yesterday or whatever. It was a really cool way to sound check before the sound check and, you know, do a little damage control. <laughs> if anything was really crazy sounding, it was really cool to mess around with. Um, the only thing that was, I had to kind of refine was whatever method I was using, I was going from an M32 into Waves Tracks Live just through the USB card on the back. And I didn't realize it until about a week in that like the gain drops going to the recording. So like I would play it back and it would come out 6 dB quieter than it went in. And I still haven't really figured <laughs> out how to tweak that in the settings. But after I was mindful of it, you can kind of correct for that. But there was a few days where the artist would say, man, my wedge feels super, super quiet. And I would think that's crazy because when I listen to it, with the virtual sound check, it was blowing my head off. And then you go up and realize the live is quieter. Like, why is that? So there are definitely some <laughs> some bugs to be worked out uh, if you're trying it in the field, but it's I really some, cool. I had some strange gain issues with tracks live. I can't remember them off the top of my head, but I did some some recordings of, of some bits for uh, a, a pantomime last year. and. I never got around to working out what the issues were because then Waves just sort of dropped their support for Tracks Live and started recommending Reaper. So since then, I've I've just switched over. Uh, I think the main the main reason, aside from the gain issue, the reason I I, I dropped Waves Live was uh, if you if you record something or import media into Tracks, and I don't know if this ever caused you any issues. If you import something or record something and then delete it, it's actually still in the, it has a media pool uh, and you have to go in and empty your media pool, which I didn't find out until I was maybe a week into performances that we were using tracks live for some playback during the show. Uh, and it had a nasty habit of crashing because there was about four gigs worth of tracks just sat in the media pool that every time you open uh, well, it probably wasn't four gig but it was it was a horrendous amount every time you open tracks live i'm pretty sure it's trying to load all of that into the the ram on the computer so it was just crashing whatever we tried to run it on um work that out and i just thought nah i'm i'm not i'm not putting myself in a position where i have to remember to clear the media pool every time I delete something, because I'm going to, I'm going to forget one day and just crash the system in the middle of a, uh, in, in the middle of a show. But yeah, I had similar weird, weird issues with gain. Yeah, it's got some, some quirks to it. I need to figure out how to get the gain to match up with what the console's doing. But other than that, it was, it worked really, really well. I was recording 32 tracks for a two hour show every single night yeah. and it, it never went down. It was awesome. Um, the gain quirks on the M32 and the X32 can probably be offset offset by the trim settings, um, and this is some this is probably something that is that can trip you up um, if you have been adjusting trims for some reason or another. Um, the X32 will when it records it will record right after the preamp gain. So it won't take into account the trims, but when you play it back, it will take into account the trims. So you should take a look at the settings um, of your preamps when you, um, when you record and when you play back, just to make sure if all the trims are set to zero and you can adjust to all levels. Um, you know, maybe even using smart, you can just, you know, play something back um, to yeah. see what the levels are or whatever. So, yeah. That's a good tip. Yeah, I'm and Kim, I'm a, I've also had an issue like 
the quirks of the M32, X32 with recording, like, because I, I was usually used to the CLQL where you can really dial in, because it, at least how I do it, it uses a direct out from the board, so you can adjust it there. But the M32, you get exactly what your gain is. So, and kind of the, what Liam said, I, I went from using Pro Tools Live, then I went to Tracks Live, because Pro Tools, I'm sure it works great, but at least my scenario, when doing live recording, it would just be like, hey, I'm having an issue. I'm going to crash now and good luck. So went to tracks, but I kind of liked Reaper more because I then didn't have to import it. And just that one of the many nice things about Reaper, I encourage anybody, but what if you have to try Reaper out, it's an amazing piece of recording software. It's light. Even if you have an old potato, it will take it. But it allows you also, when you have to do like new shows every time, this is not as important for like touring, but if you have a new show, you can always, uh, you can sequentially tell it in input. So if like have 32 inputs, you can tell it, all right, input one through 32, boom. So you don't have to go one, two, three. Um, but uh, I totally forgot what I was gonna say on that, but just like, yeah, so that is an issue with the M32 Reaper and yeah, so. Uh, yeah, we'll I need to get on the Reaper train, clearly. <laughs> And it's, it's, it's an affordable train too. And like, I cannot stress enough and like whenever, it's an amazingly powerful piece of software that even the trial, it doesn't watermark it or anything. So you can get a trial and it's only 60 bucks at this point. Uh, it, there's a ton of stuff you can do. It's like one of the most open source styles I've ever encountered. So, and it just runs like my Mac over here, Pro Tools, when it gets to eight tracks, it just goes, sorry this it can get to like 30 and it goes i'm good so it's reaper not free i thought i thought reaper was free it's so free for the evaluation you uh, put evaluation version what you get a, a pop-up uh i mean if you wanted to you can just keep clicking i'm still evaluating and it, yeah. it will it won't affect the performance at all like yeah, scott said there's no there's no limitations and no freaking annoying dongle yeah But yeah, yeah so, Reed was Reed was really good. But yeah, so kind of get back to our virtual playback. Just anyone else's experiences or curiosities with using it. A game game changer, absolute necessity. And I think like all these issues that were that people are having, these are going to be sorted out over the next few years. I think you know every engineer is kind of getting used to the idea of being able to have them. And I think that it's going to be an essential part of the workflow going forward. And it's amazing what they like, Alan. He all this all the smaller console manufacturers can do going on a USB sticks and playing back. It's great. I mean, I do it with the uh, SXL and pro tools, um, the Abbott SXL, but those are, those interchange really well and they're, they're great, but it's, you know, it's an expensive I, system. I have a question about virtual sound tech stuff. I've only ever done it once. And when I say I've done it, what I mean is a sound designer for a musical has done it and I've kind of been there. Um, this was many years ago. Um, I used Dante for it. Um, I, I've never done it ever since. I've not done it ever since, and I, I don't really know how to do it. So, if, you, if, if does anyone have any experience of using Dante to do it? Do you need is the DAW you need to use Nuendo? There. So, so oh, Scott, I, I I have experience with Dante. If you, if you don't mind, go ahead. So, I, how you do it with Dante? There's a few things you well, not that many. So, I'll use my example, which. Other boards use Dante, but primarily the CLQL uses Dante natively. So I've used you, Dante loads. It's just more the sound check side of things. I've never. Right. So, so you, I'm, you obviously are familiar with Dante, how Dante works for the most part. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I'm Yamaha CLs and QLs is my console cool. of choice. So. so you do not have to use Nuendo. Now, Nuendo like, is the equivalent of how Avid and Pro, uh, the S. It, SXL and Pro Tools work so well together. It's the same thing with the CLQ on the window. You can uh, use any DAW you want. Like I said, I've used, I've used Waves, I've used Pro Tools. The key bit is on your computer, of a playback of choice, Mac or PC. I think Linux does it, but I know for sure Mac and PC. You need to have something called Dante Virtual Sound Card that basically yeah. takes your LAN port, and then enables it to send it. One of those things, one-time purchase, lifetime license. I forget how much it is, but 
what you're getting, it's really reasonable. It's to be about thirty dollars. Yeah, pound. something like so. It then will pop up in Dante controller as a uh, source. So you then <laughs> patch it from there. So you now you have to go into. It gets a little complicated with the console, but you just then patch and, it. And out. that's the bit I'm not sure about. Is I guess in the console you have to patch it to be the same machine as the DAW. So yeah, so this is where it gets a little complicated and I would recommend if you can get a QLCL or even a TF if you can rent one. All three work, the idea works about the same. You have to tell Don, and at least in the console, this is how I write it. So let's just take, for example, kick drum. You go to the kick drum channel, go to direct out and it should give you a patching option because you can add, the nice thing about Dante you can add multiple sources. So you can have like three going out, one going here, one going there, and then one going to yours. And it then will go out, but then like a send it and return of an effects, you then have to go in the controller, tell controller to read it, then go into your DAW of choice, tell it to uh, use uh, Dante Virtual Sound Card as your input, and then it will show up. So it's, it's convoluted, but not hard. Yeah. So, Hopefully, Phil, I did a good example, a explanation of getting it to you. Yeah, I mean, the company I work for, we've got a few, we've got about twelve TFs and a bunch of CLs and a bunch of QLs. So I can, sorry, I can, I can, uh, and right now, nothing's being used. So I can probably just go in and give it a try. Yeah. Thanks for that. Yeah. That's helpful. Just make sure that you do the the opposite side of of the work as well. So send your signal out from the door into your console and then into the CO QL series, you will have like a, a patch library or a patch preset. And one of those presets will be your inputs from stage boxes and the other set of your presets will be from your computer. And then when you do the virtual sound check, you can just switch between the two. Ah, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Of course. Yeah, the preset is a game changer. I was doing that when I was doing virtual sound check. So it was just like recall one preset and I was ready to do it from the card instead of from oh. the mics. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so that, that's... Have got any other yeah, Digicore right. users on here? Yeah. Dude, uh, what do you want to know? Gonna, nah, I was just... All, all of this explanation just makes me feel a little bit spoiled with the uh, listen to copy audio button <laughs> yeah it's, it's, uh, the same on, it's the same on the avid you just hit the button and it switches over yeah um but you know again there are those are hundred thousand dollar systems you know yeah. hey it's the same on the x32 so there you go yeah and and the thing with with the with the clql and the uh the revage which i've only seen never touched um uh, the window is supposed to be like i said it's supposed to be where it seemingly integrates i've yet to get it to work but so it should work there, but yeah, I, I was always, I've always been curious on like how does it go about in, in Digico land? Of if I want to do virtual sound check, I'm on a Digico. How do I go about that? Where Alex or whoever else has experience on it? Uh, you can do it really, really simply. It's if you've got a a, a rack, whether it's a D rack or a D two, whichever whichever stage rack you've got coming in on. Say for me, I'm I'm on the SD9, so it's got two uh, MADI over Cat5 ports and uh, BNC MADI ports. Say I'm coming in from a D rack into uh, the Cat5 port one or A, whichever it is on there. Uh, you can then in your routing settings, you can select the input that you're using, and then there's a drop down box that says copy two. And you can just select another output. Um, and then when, if, if you're uh, bringing audio in from that rack, it's then getting piped straight back out of the, the copy two output, which will then go to, if, if I'm using my MADI face or whatever, it's, it's piping straight out of the BNC MADI into Reaper recording. Uh, if you then have everything patched exactly the same. So it's patched to that stage rack still. If you uh, hit the button that says, listen to copied audio, any any channel that is patched to a, a channel from that original stage rack, it'll swap the patch to the 
the rack that you copied to, and it'll just listen to... It, it does it by default one to one, but there's also a, a matrix that you can you can change the routing around if if needs be. But it's you know, it's it's really straightforward. I've just set up a macro on one of the macro buttons that's just a listen to copied audio on and off. Careful um, with that, Liam. Yeah, <laughs> I remember you you leave it on one day. Was it you? Someone said they'd left it on and. Yeah, someone was talking about that. I have yeah. not. But... Well, oh, wait, okay. no, no. That, no, I, I, would, I, did, I did say that. Yeah, I, on, on an Avid, yeah. I, I left it. I was listening to the, rec the, rec or the record return from Pro Tools for like a song. Yeah. We yeah, involved in that like, someone at one point return. or another. Yeah, just like added like 10 milliseconds of latency or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> like, what's, weird? what's wrong with this picture? I was like, oh. Does the, does the Avid show you somewhere like the digicore if you're on the if you're on the, the master screen it comes up in in the box in listening to copied audio is there a some sort of indicator on the on the avid yeah i think you can um there are like on the any of the input screens like usually when you have like that extra screen on the avid sxl there's you see a channel strip or whatever there's like a big pur purple thing that pops up that kind of shows these from Pro Tools. So right. there is that kind of an icon. It's, it, you can see it. It's not like really in your face, but you can, you can tell. But when I did that, it was on a profile, which is not as, um, yeah. when I left it patched the wrong way. So, and that, which with the SXL, if you switch it back and forth, like Digico, like listen to copied audio, it's like, it's, it's fast, super fast. But the profiles, when you sw had to sw switch it, it like reset all the plugin racks. So it would take like, a full minute to reset, <laughs> so um, much more difficult. I feel like a profile, like if you're gonna make an audible screw up, it's gonna be on a profile. Like there's just so many ways. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you have to have that, you have to be in show mode, not config mode on those things or else let's Heaven do forbid you wanna move a track. <laughs> I, I, I've just had the, I think the fortune of in my audio career I've only seen, I have no disrespect to the board, but I've, I've just heard nothing but like challenges and limitations with the profiles. And I'm like, part of me is like, man, I'm glad I never had to do a show on one. I, they don't sound good. They, they do not. Yeah I've, heard, yeah, I've heard interviews were like two separate interviews Nathan's done where someone has said, yeah, my profile doesn't sound good. So I've now had to add this piece of outboard gear. I'm like, then why are you still using it? I don't know. I mean, the reason I used it I, would, I did like a year of touring with one, maybe two years. Um, and we, we did, I did shows at Mass Square Garden with that thing at big festivals. And it sounded okay, you know, like it just had took a lot of work. Um, it's like, it took a lot of EQ and it took a lot of using plugins, like third party stuff. And I would, had to use a word clock because the word clock isn't great in there. There are all kinds of tips that you had to kind of do, like always using digital outputs like the, the D to A converters and the outputs were bad. So it was always using digital outputs into the lake. You know, there are all these tricks, but you know, it had definitely some good sounding shows on them, but it just, it just took a lot of work. Yeah, no, no, not trying to put that on the board or anything. Uh, so anyone else have any like questions or things they kind of want to talk about, about virtual sound check? Because if not, we'll kind of now segue, because I think we've talked a good hour and a half, which is about, I think how long the actual presentation was. Um, if not, I think it would be good. We will segue into uh, Liam's presentation. You want to talk about? So, well, anyone else, <laughs> anyone, anyone else kind of on this topic, or feel like we've kind of exhausted it? Not sure if Liam was so confident with his well. So now we're all waiting for what he. My, has to do. my, my uh, I, I'm not sure whether going from from your summit talk to my summit talk, or whether going from your summit talk to your non-summit talk. Uh, which of those would be a better idea? Because I'm looking through my notes now, and we've already covered most of what I was going to talk about. Because um, I was, I don't if for those who didn't read the the post on Goes to Eleven, uh, I was going to go over Drew Brashler's uh, talk, which uh, is the, a lot of the notes I've got have already been discussed, particularly the non-technical things. Uh, with it being a, a servant attitude and uh, communicating with band members. So we've kind of gone through a lot of that. So um, it might, 
it, it might be easier uh, to keep talking about something else if anyone's got anything that they want to talk about because the only other way I can now go straight into talking about Drew Brashler's talk is to hit pretty hard into the discussion of monitors, which is just going to be a big sales pitch for Alish's new course. <laughs> so if I'm going to hate that, know, man. If, Don't if, do if that. I, if Alish wants to just talk about monitor mixing for an hour and a half and give his course away for free, then we can continue. It's uh, to be to be honest, one thing we can, one thing I would like to talk about, um, and I'd like to hear uh, as many as many viewpoints on this as possible. Elliot's already brought this up in goes to eleven, which was uh, Drew Brashler's. Uh, gain structure which I know a lot of people go for one of the two sort of main uh, schools of thought of either and, and again Alish has uh, brought out a, a YouTube video today for anyone that hasn't seen it go and watch it because this covers quite a lot of these things so today's been quite fun for me I had uh, I turned the TV on earlier opened the YouTube app and there's Alish's face with uh, a, a discussion about gain structure, We're covering most of the notes that I talked about. Alice, are you paying Liam? What's going on? <laughs> I, I don't know whether he's paying me or stalking me. <laughs> <It's>, um, <laughs> maybe well, yeah, both. Uh, yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah, Al and Alice, where's that bottle of champagne you said I was going to get? Yeah. It's uh, uh, it's in the mail. I think it's getting uh, disinfected at the border between <laughs> uh, Slovenia, Italy, and uh, Austria. But uh, you know they're polishing every air bubble in, inside that. Thing, well, it's so. going to take even longer because I live in Vermont, and the the the, the, the post is even slower here. So I'll, I'll wait for it. <laughs> but yeah, I think monitor uh, just the whole idea of uh, see you later, Phil. Um, just the whole idea of yeah monitors because I think unless I think a lot of us seem to have the experience from front of house mainly if I was to like make a pie chart of all my mixing experience it most of it I, I don't really count the front mixing from like yeah it counts but it half in my opinion counts half is mixing monitors from front of house because that's a that's a whole interesting topic but mixing pure monitors I think I've actually only done one gig in my entire like five six year audio career of pure monitors and that's a i think a neat fun topic we can kind of talk about so well, let's kind of get started from there and like what drew brashner kind of, there and i feel there was a few other ideas that drew brought up on there that we didn't bring up in the other one so yeah there was certainly some of the 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 more technical aspects that he discussed um so the first thing that I've got written down about anything remotely technical was, uh, I wanted to know if anyone's tried his method of panning the click. No? No, but I want to. I just need a show to do it. Yeah. Yep, it's, well so it's, it, it's super effective. Like if, if you remove the click um, from the center and put it to it, it it's not necessarily like all the way to one side, but just slightly off center. Um, when I when I think about mixing for drummers or mixing in general, and I think this is still from my studio work, is I try to figure out the balance of things. So okay, the kick and the snare are there, and then you have the hi hat, right? So. The hi-hat has a frequency content that is usually quite high. And then on the other side of the spect spectrum, there's not really much there that can sort of balance this hi-hat out, right? So what you can do is if you have like a tambourine player, that, you know, that's a trick that's been used in, in, in studio work for a long time. Like if you have a really aggressive hi-hat, what you can do is without trying to sort of fix it in the mix is add a tambourine which is pitched just slightly slower and slightly lower and then sort of balance it on the other side and that will sort of remove that presence of hi-hat from one side so if you have like a high-pitched click just balance it balance it off slightly 
um, on the opposite side of the hi-hat and that can work wonders. So you can basically have um, a, a high-pitched information balance between the left and the right side and that can be super precise, especially if, if the drummer is uh, keeping his time according to the hi-hat, which most drummers do because this is where the, the groove sets in. So if they hit the first one um, right, then, you know, Bob's your uncle. Um, plus, in my opinion, great drummers do this trick where the, the, kick is, uh, the click is not prevailing, but they have the mentality of, if I hear the click, I'm out of time. If I don't hear it, that means that my hits are covering the beat of the click. So if, if you can sort of get that mentality installed in your drummers, then you can maybe reduce the volumes that they are operating with. So yeah, um, pan your clicks, it will change your life and improve your relationships. Which um, kind of, I think Alex, you also covered this when you did your uh, presentation at Life Sound Summit, uh, kind of the relationship with the artist and this kind of segues into something that, um, I can't remember the name, his last name. There's an old, a sound engineer my, my parents knew back in the old days, Rance, like Calderwood or Cansford or something, but they were good friends with him. And long story short, he told a story of how he always kept his eyes on the artist, which is uh, compared like when we do front of house, for the most part, yeah, we'll have someone who will come up to be like, oh, the guitar is too loud. But for the most part, we get to make it be how we want it to hear monitors it doesn't matter like what you think is right it's literally this is customer service and getting their attention and knowing what they want seems to be the, the key bit is what i found the one time i did monitors was i was just like doesn't matter what i want i and i don't say is it loud enough that's not the issue with most of them most of it's like is it sound good? What sounds good for you? Like, what do you want? Like, I will continually always, and even when I'm doing front from front of house, my idea is like, what what do you want? Because that is what monitors the whole idea is what they need to hear. We can go in the whole talk of what each member needs, but it's like just having to really check even more your ego. Be like, this is not about me. This is about what they want. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, from from that, that kind of reminded me of one of the other points that he had written down was uh, that being a monitor engineer is a thankless task. Now, in my experience, uh, I, I, I'm like yourself, I've mixed monitors, but from front of house. Um, now, mixing monitors from front of house, I've always been, I've done that from the point of view of being a, a, a venue staff which means that I'm working with an artist that isn't touring their own engineer uh, for either either positions. And I've always found in, in that role that people thank you quite a lot. And maybe it's because they're not touring an engineer and they've had a uh, bad experience with the, the house engineers that they've been given. Uh, and it's nice for them to finally have a decent mix. Um, and maybe that, maybe that swings totally the other way when you are a dedicated monitor engineer and there's more, there's a there's a higher expectation. Um, but in my personal experience, and I'd, I'd I'd love to know what other people have experienced. Um, you know, if if you give them, like you say, Scott, it's not just a case of everything being loud. It's it's giving them what it is that they want to hear. And if they can hear the things that they want to hear uh, and, and, and they sound the way that they want them to sound, then it, it, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't always have to be a thankless task. Um, you know, it's, it's quite nice when you've got an artist that comes off the stage, you know, from, I, I wander from front of house and head backstage and someone says, sounds great out there tonight, thanks. Um, and then you kind of get onto like wondering what engineers they've had in the past, but yeah, I mean, what what for anyone that's mixed front of house and monitors or, or mixed uh, solely monitors, 
what what have other people experienced in the uh, thankless task kind of regard? I've, I've had a similar experiences to you, Liam, in that um, people, especially there's one venue that I do and I am, you know, the technical department um, and a lot of bands, especially on the sort of folk and more, more roots kind of end of things, really are very thankful. Um, and I think a lot of that is the case that engineers must just be butchering it. You know, like we were talking about kind of carving out stuff with EQ and compressing everything. And like, if it's a fiddle and an acoustic guitar, then you should just turn it up and make sure they can hear themselves. And I think a lot of people don't, obviously don't get that. And I, I know being a house engineer, I think you do get that um, comparison to if they had a bad night last night, then you're going to come off, you know, better. Yeah. yeah I had a... Not gone. I know, uh, Elliot, I had a similar experience. The last band I mixed, uh, it was a seven piece world piece music group, which I, I love them. And I actually was the reason why they got booked at the venue, but that's another story. They, I was there, it was either during setup or teardown. They were talking about how the previous two shows they had were just, they had atrocious experiences. Seven piece band, guess how many monitors they were given at the last gig? Three. And I'm like, what? Because I made sure each guy had a monitor. I think, I think I gave one person two just because of the way the setup made sense, but they, they were totally appreciative. And in fact, like, not trying to toot my own horn, but almost, I think out of all the gigs I've done at this one venue, almost, I've even had, because I have it on recordings, they've name checked me during the middle of the show, though, you know, thank everybody and thanks Scott for doing sound. I was just like, every time, like, but it's, I think it's because I also go for that whole idea of making sure they get what they want. In fact, I will not, I forget what's the saying, you know, spite your nose. And I will, I will on purpose focus my sound check for the monitors when I'm doing front of house for monitors. Cause I'm like, I can easily, it's the Sophie's choice, but I can easily, when the shows get started, I can really, you know, fest my front of house mix, but trying to adjust the level of the kick drum and the singer's monitor during a show will halt the show to like nothing else will. So, and you know, there's always minor stuff, but so I will, I, in fact, my last show I did, I spent all my time on monitors, but whole show i think maybe i had like one adjustment but that's the nature of it but from the first note their monitor mix was pretty much was just rocking so kind of lost the point of it but i've i've just been thanked there because it's like as we mentioned the previous one did all the things greeted them with a handshake and made it be like i'm i'm customer service with you guys so and oftentimes having that pre where they had the previous experience of just someone who were like why are you doing this? What, like, are you trying to make it worse? But so when you come into a, a situation, I think it's in any field, even like regardless of what your application is, is where you're really caring about what you're doing, it shows. And even if you're quote unquote, not the best at what you're doing, some usually people can recognize, oh, they're really trying and trying to help me in this scenario. So yeah, I've, for the most, I've been thanked. In fact, like most of the people who've given me the, I've never been thanked. I'm like, yeah, because I've worked with you and you're not fun to work with. So yeah, I, I think um, I, I, it depends what kind of thanks you're looking for as well. Whether it's a a face to face thanks as as someone leaves the stage, is one thing. Or or are you looking for the uh, on stage speaking to the audience? I'd like to thank Liam and the crew, kind of, because. I've worked plenty of shows where, uh, when I was when I was at the venue, where people knew my name because I was doing sound. They didn't necessarily know the name of whoever was duty stage that night because um, they didn't really have any interaction with them. Uh, so again, that, that that goes back to right at the start of this this session. Um, and and one of the things that I had first in my notes was that building a relationship from the outset with an artist, because um, if you you know, the, uh, unless unless they're just going to stand there and say I'd like to thank the venue staff, uh, but I always got from from crew wo working under me it would be someone would say I'd like to thank 
uh, Liam on sound, so and so on lights, I'd like to thank, blah blah and then there'd be, and the rest of the crew and whoever fell into that, and the rest of the crew for that particular day the next time I saw them, it'd always be like oh, you got thanks, where was our thanks, We nobody knows our name it's like, yeah, make make people know your name you know, put yourself forward I, I'm, I'm quite happy, I make myself out to be this antisocial really miserable kind of person um talking talking one to name tags um talking one to one if i have to go and speak to uh, a particular band member i'm i'm quite happy to go and do that um one thing i didn't like doing was probably something that would be up your street scott was the whole uh right we've got a a group of dancers or a group of whatever uh, you've got to go and do the health and safety talk and I had to stand there and say hi my name's Liam um, this is the safety curtain blah 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 and I, I would I would hit that. that's that's the point where I would just start tripping over my own words um, but a lot of the crew I was working with and I don't know whether obviously some stereotypes are based on on fact but there's a there's a you know, some I think some people who work in theatre and work backstage in theatre love the fact that it is, uh, you know, they're, they're kind of hiding in the dark and they don't necessarily have to talk to people. They're not they're not customer service. And then those same people are the ones that are asking where their thanks was at the end of the night when they've just sat in the shadows and hid. So you kind of, you know, you can't have it both ways. You've got to make yourself known if you want to get thanked or do an exceptional job and 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 it can go the other way right because i've been working with um with a really famous uh female singer she's been around for what 30 odd years at, at the you know top of her game and um, I was brought in to do a couple of shows for her acoustic um, setup like two years ago. We started working together. And then like after the first show where, where I took over the, the audio stuff and she never really had like a, a sound person of any kind for her shows. They, they were usually like smaller type things where like her and the piano, but she never she never did like a lot of live band gigs they were either you know playback stuff or you know accompanied by maybe one musician and then we did this like small tour with the band and she was so excited that i was there taking care of the sound that when it got time to sort of end you know this is the band i would and she would go on to and this is our sound guy and my thanks was longer than everybody else's on stage just because she was so excited that she finally had someone taking care of that side for her and it was it was sort of like embarrassing I'm, I'm i'm behind the mixer now people in the audience are not sure if they should they should be looking back or what what's the deal with this guy and why is he so special and she went on and on like you know really minutes went by and everybody was like oh come on lady he can't be that good um but i mean it it can it can get like an, on the opposite side of the spectrum it's nice to be thanked but you know don't overdo it because like you said sometimes it's it's better to be like people just knowing that they did a good job by our own standards because they are so much higher than what the audience is expecting sometimes even higher than what the artist is expecting so if you can meet your own standards and say hey man i really nailed this gig that's sometimes you know more valuable than anything else that comes out of the mouth of other people i mean if you get recognition like you did a good job that's perfect um but most of the times you know it i mean you will know by the end of the gig if you did a good job or not right I would much prefer almost for them to not say anything on stage. I find it so awkward. Like I had one show, it was the artist's hometown on the tour and his whole family drove in on a party bus from New Jersey to this show. And they were up right by me. And this was the one show where he said my name during the show 
and then the desk crashed. <laughs> and so I'm like trying to fix this horrible issue. And his uncle is like yelling across me to another uncle, like, you got this, Kimmy, you, you got this. And I was like, oh my gosh, don't look, just, <laughs> just, ah. I would much rather just be anonymous most of the time. And if they want to give me a high five afterwards, great. <laughs> Yeah, plus, I mean, people on stage never know how it really sounds in, in the venue, right? So they could be enjoying their awesome monitor sound, but, you know, it sounds like shit because you have, like, a crappy PA system or whatever, and people are just, like, hanging on, you know, barely until the end of the show, and now here she is thanking everybody from the sound crew that which did, like, an amazing job, and, like, yeah, really? That's amazing? Mm-hmm, yeah. yeah. Do better, do better. Yeah, it's funny where where people's personal standards, um, where that where that goes. Um, I don't know if anyone. I think it was today's uh, Pooch and Chris Raybould video on YouTube, and one of the things they were talking about was uh, venues where he said it might sound like shit. He said, but you've got to you've got to remember that most of the people at that gig go to that venue. He said, as long as it doesn't sound like shit in like relative to that venue you know the the audience might be thinking this sounds amazing but you might be kicking yourself um and it's uh having having those standards is a bit of a tightrope walk i think because it's you've kind of got to let yourself have that that like uh that leeway of thinking well okay maybe it was the maybe it was the venue maybe i did as well as i could um but then also not not let yourself get complacent, um, and it's. I think this is one of those venues where it, it you can you can be working at any level and still find things that you want to improve about yourself. Um, I watched a, a a video recently. It was a Jacob Collier masterclass. He was teaching a bit of music theory. And he said as a kid, his ears were always far better than his technique. He said, and that was, that was great because it gave him something to constantly work at. Um, and he said, even, even to this day now, at the, the grand old age of 24 or whatever he is, um, he still finds that his ear is far more developed than his, his technique. And he, he said he loves that fact because it's just always, it, it gives him something to grow into. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it, it's, it's good to let yourself have those days where you just think there's nothing I could have done there. I did as, as, as well as I could, but maybe, maybe we should, you know, I, I would hate to think that I was just forever saying I couldn't have done any better than that. That's as, as well as I could, you know, I'd like to think that, there's sort of like a, a healthy amount of sort of kicking myself saying you could have done better there. You, you know, you missed that guitar solo or you, you did this or you did that. Um, so yeah, it's kind of a, a knowing yourself issue, I think. Yeah. And that's, it's an interesting thing of like, whenever you deal with something, what we do, it's artistic. Yeah. We can argue there is some technical aspect to a lot, what we do, but it's like, Unlike, let's say, you know, a weightlifter or a sprinter, you know, all right, they ran the one mile in this amount of time, but this week they were this much faster. For us, it's subjective of like, whether it be monitors, front of house or whatever, it's like, well, did I do better? Did I do worse? It's always hard to compare, kind of compare, your, you know, compare progress. Like, yeah, we could kind of maybe like, you know, listen to old mixes we did, but there's only so much because that's only an aspect of what our job is. It's like, yeah, there's the audio aspect, but there's also the interpersonal. It's like, I feel I've also grown as getting better with my interpersonal relationships with dealing with new and recurring artists. So it's just kind of an open topic. We kind of just stumbled upon, like just wondering, like I've always had the attitude of like, I can do better. Like even if I've done awesome, like, I don't know if, to give the comparison there's if has anyone seen the movie uh, ford versus ferrari 
so without spoiling how the movie ends, it's a, I recommend it. But there's the main character. Oh, I'm just facing on his name, but he's this. He he just becomes the like main driver for for during this era when they were in this big race. Now at one point he's like this mechanic, but he's also the driver. And there's a scene where he's on. He hears on the radio. He's in a garage because he couldn't go for that race, and he goes. Yeah, that's gonna happen. That's gonna happen, and it then all happens because he's realize he's always in the head of like, well, how can we make this machine better? And then fast forward, there's a race where he doesn't go too well. It doesn't go too well, but at the end, when he's walking away with the other guy, he says, "Well, let's figure out how to do it better next year." So I always feel I don't know if anyone else has this mentality, but I always feel that is me, where it's like, yeah, we did awesome, but I'm like, how can we do it better next time? Which some people had has drive them nuts because I had one person say it's like Scott, you can't just settle what it is. I'm like, yeah, I know, but I want to make it better. I want to either streamline it, make it sound better. So I hope I'm just not the only one who has that of like, maybe I want to make it better. It's already awesome, but I want to make it even better. You're not the only one, but you can you can also rest assured that it's not about you. Um, well, sometimes it's not about you because especially if if you're touring with a band, you can see it you know, from show to show that it's, it's the same setup, the same PA, this, it can be the same venue and two shows will sound completely different just because of the energy of the band and the energy of the audience. And there's, there's not a mic position in the world that you can do. There's not an EQ move that you can do to fix that. So especially in monitors, you can really, just because you're closer to to the sound and it doesn't change that much from 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 night to night but i can i can tell you like definitively there's a an x amount of percent um of variance from night to night that is um unchecked for in terms of you know anything that we can do technically and it, it can be you know something is not gelling or maybe there was something bad for lunch that day, or you know somebody got off on the wrong foot, and it it, it can be nothing. Like everybody's happy, but the it, the energy is not there. So sometimes it's it's not you, it, and it doesn't mean that we're off the hook and that we shouldn't, like you said, you know, strive to be better and better. But on the other hand, you also have to realize that, hey, you know crappy shows will happen and it cannot be all your blame right um it's usually it usually is so if you especially if you're the monitoring engineer it will be your uh it will be your blame and it will be your fault um but it comes with the job you know sometimes it's it is just the way it is and there's nothing you can do except like be the best moral support for your artist that you can like smile you know, fist pump, whatever it is that your artist needs from you. Sometimes it's just like being really focused and, you know, keeping, keeping um, your eyes locked on them will help them out. Um, and sometimes you know what it's about. Sometimes you figure, you figure out beforehand, like maybe the band or one of the members is going through like a family crisis or, you know, there's stuff going on in their lives as well. Um, that will definitely impact the show. I mean, with the band that I've been working with, we've done everything from, you know, death in the family to um, whatever it is, breakups, you know, children going under surgery, whatever it is. But, you know, these things will throw off the show, you know, in, in, in a heartbeat. And there's just nothing you can do technically. You can be there, you know, on a, on a psychological level on a social level but there's not a knob that you can turn that will make it better for that night right one of the good things about live music though is you leave at the end of the night and go do another show the next day it's uh, you can some artists can't let, let stuff go and those tend to be the ones to, that are bad to work for in my opinion but you know you gotta, you gotta let it go at some point and do it do it next yeah time. i was gonna say the exact same thing that like that's one of my favorite things about working in live sound is that you know every show is different and if it's bad there's no record of it you know <laughs> it just the ones you know take the place of that in your memory a lot of the time and you only remember the best shows on the 
of the week you don't remember the one that was weird for whatever reason you know it's i've also like told artists this like if something goes wrong during a show like the audience likes that because it's unique it's like oh you this crazy thing happened and something broke so the band stood around for 10 minutes like telling stories and that made that show special for people like that i think it's really common for the audience yeah. to not care because it's live music you know I don't totally think, like people don't show up to a show to expect to hear the record that show yeah. that i was talking about where the board went down and i was frantically trying to fix it that show what how we fixed that was that there's a song where they would just do like bluegrass style everybody around one mic and do like an acoustic version and for that show they just kind of said well we'll just do it acapella and we'll just do it no mics we'll just tell the crowd to be super super quiet and it was like total magic moment like <laughs> you know the audience was so in on that moment you know and afterwards they were all talking about how cool that moment was meanwhile i was you know panicking but <laughs> yeah. it all worked out it was beautiful worst um, part of but worst part of the show for you was the best part of the show for them what well, might be an interesting uh, segue on this because i realized we're kind of talking on the topic of monitors uh, might segue from an, another talk, which was, um, unless someone feels like we want to talk more on it, might be uh, Lauren's talk about the difference between male and female hearing with in-ear monitors. Because that one was really fascinating to me. Anyone else want to talk on what we were fit or be all cool to move on to that one? Oh, yeah, that's fine. Uh, Scott, did you want to talk more or? or okay. Uh, so I'll just say you, my little You've upset him, he's gone. No, so sorry, I gotta run, guys. Sorry, I'll see you. All right, see ya. Thank, thanks for coming, Scott. Catch you later. Uh, and again, thank you everyone for coming for this. Uh, but the key bit I liked the, is that fascinated me. And my mother, I actually had it on this on the TV, and my mother was watching, and she's been in some of the like interested stuff of explaining what I do. And that talk really fascinated. And for me, it was like things I kind of knew, but it was like, oh, okay, like just knowing like one of the key points was that. Women, if I correct me if I'm wrong on this, women are more sensitive to the high end than men, and men are more sensitive to the low end. And to me, that was like an eye opener of like, that explains a lot because when I do monitors, whether it be printer house or dedicated, again, I go the whole idea of like, well, what's what do you want in it? So, and I realized I'm like, yeah, a lot of times with female musicians, they'd often want the low end, uh, not the low end, sorry, the high end cut. Or like even one musician, she came and she had drove from somewhere to get there. And she was like, she was complaining, not meanly, it was just like, man, there's this high end thing. And like, I was working with it. Like at the time I didn't know. And it's like, so it still helped because I was still acknowledging it to her. I wasn't saying, no, you're not hearing it. I'm like, if the artist thinks they're hearing something, they're hearing it. Don't, whether it be male, female, I don't care what the gender is. If the artist is telling you out loud, they hear something they don't like, they're telling you because they're, they're not trying, even ones that are dramatic, they're telling you as the monitor or front of house for monitors, they're telling you for a reason. But that gets back to the, just the idea of like, oh, that explains like a lot about, and I'm, I feel, I hate to put you on the spot, Kim, but like, it's, you're, but just that, I, Words are going to come out of my mouth, but just that idea of like, okay, that does explain a lot about male and female hearing. So. Totally. I mean, everybody hears differently and those generalizations are so interesting. Like the high end thing, especially like, I always just kind of assumed it was an age thing where like a lot of shows that I would go to and the engineer is like an older guy. I always just thought it was an age thing that made me feel like, man, this feels really bright. It must just be because he's old you know <laughs> but maybe it's also a gender difference you know in addition to that <laughs> or maybe i'm just too sensitive who knows <laughs> well and i i i, I you, that brings up a good topic is like also like with the age thing it's like i think if again correct me if I'm wrong, i think it mentioned that for the most part women from what the survey the data said women's hearing for the most part doesn't deteriorate as much in age because of uh What's the opposite of testosterone? I feel so idiot. Oh, right now. estrogen. Um, yeah. Yeah, because women have estrogen, that helps to hold their 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 hearing better. So, but yeah, it's it's. Uh, yeah, it just made me think more like, 
whether it be insults or compliments of like male versus female musicians I've worked with in the past. It's just like, huh. And it kind of made me like, man, I wish there could be more studies. I would gladly love to know, participate in more studies that, and the weird thing is, I think I have one interesting acute hearing that's different than I would say the most, because long story short, I live with my mother. She is like the best hearing you'll ever know, but like, I've had to attune my hearing a little bit. Like, I still think I would probably, on the spectrum, still go more into the male sensitivity, but because of the way my ears have been trained with living with her in a good way, I might lean a little bit more towards the sensitive of the high end. In fact, like, I, I can, it, I don't know, just like, let's kind of bring that because I can't think of anyone on that topic of everyone else on the call. What do you think on that and your experiences? Well, I was also going to say, like, there's so many factors, too, like, in those studies that Lorraine's talking about, like, I wonder if they're of sound engineers, or are they just regular people? Because there's a huge difference between, like, somebody that hears for their job and what they can hear and discern versus, like, you know, a construction worker. Like, in college, I took a class on psychoacoustics with um, Susan Rogers. I don't know if you guys know her, but she's amazing. Um, and she was talking about that there were studies done on people that work in like loud environments and as how their hearing deteriorates you know construction or just loud environments where it's noise it's not music or anything those people lose their hearing even faster than regular people but for example like organ tuning is apparently one of the like loudest jobs ever but it's super critical. Like those people are in a really loud environment, but it's critical listening. And those people retained their hearing longest out of anybody on the study. So it, you know, your brain keeps what it's using and you can like, you know, rearrange. If you lose the physical parts of your hearing, it's possible for your brain to like, you know, work around that. And if you, you know, use your reference mixes, you can potentially overcome whatever physical hearing loss you might get as you age. Like there's- You've muted- I can't, you muted yourself at the last bit. Oh no. Well, basically just, you know, there's so much more to learn and I would love to read more studies about it. Right. Uh, and what you, you may, oh. I was you just gonna say, uh, 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 I, uh, tripping over each other here, Scott. Uh, <laughs> uh, just, just carrying on with what you were saying there, Kim, it's, uh, I, I wonder how much of these studies Take that, yeah, I wonder how much of these studies take that into account because the the industries that you were talking about there are all sort of historically very male-driven uh, industries. Construction work, uh, armed forces dealing with explosives and weapons. Um, a lot of industries where there might be uh, industry-caused hearing loss uh, have probably been historically uh, majoritively male. So I, I'd love to know how much that's affected these studies versus uh, actual genetics. Uh, you know, totally. maybe, maybe in 20 or 30 years when there's been uh, a generation of people moving, moving into these industries that are, are women rather than men, um, then maybe the, the studies will look a little bit different. Um, uh, ho hopefully someone will redo these studies at that point and, and we'll get to see, but yeah, interesting. My, my first thought is like, maybe we should like email Lauren and be like, yo, it'll be a small group, but like maybe we get a whole bunch of people from Goes to 11 and like from the summit and be like, even if it's a small group, just see like, for example, Kim, let's, like my theory is like, would your and my hearing, would ours match up? Because of, like I mentioned, like how my ears have been tuned, would ours match or would I still have the more the sensitive to the low end and like our job? Because we, I forget someone else's, the medical industry, they don't know we exist. They like, I remember one person was talking about how like he was trying to explain to them how loud concerts get. And they're like, no way, you're making it up. No way. And I was trying to say him, then take them to one concert and they'll understand. And he was like, no, no, no. And I understood the situation, but I'm like, no, this is, you have to take them there. Are, and, but also Kim, you mentioned about the older people. It's like, sometimes you would think like in the recording industry, you would think, oh, mastering engineers, there's an age gap. Uh-uh, most of your times, your renowned mastering engineers 
are like at least 50, if not older. So you're like, and you look at what they've done. And, and even as a young person, you're like, I can hear everything in this. So the brain can adjust to it. So yeah, I, I found an enormous amount of hope when I was listening to Susan talk about that, that like, you know, you hear, and especially like both my parents have hearing loss related to age. And like, they, they're accountants, you know, they're not in loud environments. And I remember hearing that and thinking, man, maybe there is hope that I won't be my parents' age and have to wear hearing aids, you know? <laughs> but I would like to think I can continue to work to that age. <laughs> Same, and I remember her the one bit, yes, the whole science, but like when she mentioned, you know that buzzing you hear randomly in your ear? That's not your hearing going. And I'm like, oh my God, thank God. Because I'm sure we've all been told that myth that if you're like, as you're walking around and suddenly you hear that buzz that, yeah, that's that fruit. That's the last time you'll ever hear that frequency in your life. And like, I would be driving and I don't listen to loud music. In fact, I'm one of the sound engineers who gets told to make it louder. And even so, when I would hear that, I'd be like, what am I doing wrong? Ah, but when she said that, I'm like, oh, it's your ear making the sound. And actually that's the healthier. I'm like, oh my God, made me so less stressed out. <laughs> Can I just jump in with a quick question for you guys? How annoyed do you get uh, listening to random sounds around the house? Extremely. Uh, <laughs> what do you mean by random? Just like um, everyday sounds or, or, or sounds that you don't want to be there? Yeah, like um, noise, like buzzing from a bad power supply or a high frequency emission from a bad LED bulb or, uh, you know, something that is present but you know people don't notice until you point it out and then there's you know absolutely nothing you can do to not hear it and yet oh, they yeah. still don't hear it like are you the ones pointing out stuff to like you know members of your family or your friends when it comes to sound or you know i used to um when i was when i was a kid and I'm not sure whether this is this is probably more uh, a technological change rather than uh, an age thing. Uh, I used to be able to walk up my stairs and hear if my TV was on standby, uh, and it was an old cathode ray tube uh, TV. So the, the, there was some sort of component in that TV that's probably not in modern flat screens that was whirring away at some ridiculously high pitched frequency. And I used to, I could hear it halfway up the stairs and no one else in the house could, could hear it. It was like a dog whistle. Um, now the only thing that really bothers, the only thing that I can think of off the top of my head is um, my walls are paper thin and I can hear my neighbours having a conversation. Um, it's muffled, but I can hear... <laughs> I have to keep my TV on. Like during, I've only noticed it since the lockdown started. Um, but I, I just keep my TV on constantly now so that I, I can't hear my neighbours talking. Because this is what I've been, I've been thinking about, um, especially when the lockdown started, is hearing is the, basically the only sense that we have that we cannot turn off. Right? It's constantly on. And um, noise affects your stress levels it affects even if if you don't hear it if even if if you're not aware of it, it it's still there it's still present it still eats away i mean that's why hypnosis work, works right you you can listen to something while you are sleeping or while you're not fully awake or conscious and it will still penetrate directly into your brain right so what I was thinking was everybody's at home and they're not aware of what their sound environment is like. So I was um, toying with the idea of starting a movement called listen, to, listen for Noise, where we would basically, you know, as sound engineers, implore people to do like one of those um, ALS things, like ice bucket challenge, but, you know, instead of doing that is go around the house, find two things that you can turn off and like reduce the noise and then challenge three other people to do that and see if we can get like the background noise of the entire world to sort of drop down. 
I am and if sure. that if that can sort of influence the stress levels that we have on a daily basis. I'm so for that. And you mentioned that, Alex. And I was thinking for me, it'd be pretty hard because I live in a very rural area. So there's not a lot of noise. Any noise that kind of pops up, I hear it. And as mentioned, my mother also has like super sensitive level of hearing. So we're kind of an outlier of that. Like I hear like when the CD drive goes off on her computer or the hard drives, not the click, but I hear it rural. Um, you know, the, the, set, the, the turn on sounds, so I can hear that. And like the fan I use, the external fan I use to cool my computer, same thing. I can hear it when I have it plugged in, but just on also day-to-day -day life. Like I'll tell this story because when I was one time uh, flying somewhere, remember those days, <laughs> um, I was going through JFK airport. I had these headphones on. I had music playing, it wasn't blaring, but I had it at a decent volume. I could still hear the TVs, like the news or whatever. And I'm just thinking, I'm like, if this is me wearing headphones, how loud is it? And like, but are you thinking like how attuned have now people gone to thinking that that sound just is normal because I'm like, I even, I don't have it on me. It's up on the keychain. There's this little device called TV be gone. You click it. It runs through all of the off signals for all the TVs of all the manufactured TVs. Eventually you get to it, but you can turn off the TV. Cause I'm like, yeah, and I just like, if no one's watching it, especially I'm like, why do we have this noise pollution on it? Just, so yeah, to answer, long story to answer your question, Alex, like, yeah, like, I like to keep, like, I'm not like, oh, it needs to be dead quiet. No, I like having music going on, but I'm like, unnecessary noise, there's gotta be a way to, produce it. <laughs> yeah, we had, my, sorry, go on. Oh, uh, I, I was just going to say we had a big storm, I don't know, maybe a month ago here. And most of the city had no power for, oh gosh, three or four days. And I remember we were just sitting on the couch when it came back on. And it was amazing to hear how much stuff started making sounds that you would never think about. Like, our wireless modem makes this crazy sound. The fridge, the freezer, the air conditioning, you know, fans, it all just came all back on at the same time. And it was exactly what you're talking about. Just things you'd never think about. Yeah, I had the, um, I had the exact same um, experience, only it was a bit longer. Um, let me think, to 2012, a huge ice storm hit our region and for 14 days, we were without electricity. Um, and even though I was, I'm, I'm a volunteer firefighter and I was, you know, in uniform, in uniform for like 13 of those 14 days. But um, even with all that noise and commotion going on with our, you know, sirens and everything, when it actually came back on, I had the exact same, exact same notion. Like, oh my God, this is, this is absolutely nuts and everything was turned off. I mean, nothing sort of started blaring and, you know, the TV didn't come on and the radio didn't come on, but it was just like, like you mentioned, like the freezer and the, the for, for me, it's, uh, it's hard disks from, from my storage solution, like um, uh, offline servers and stuff like that. So it's just all that noise that you don't actually pay attention to, but it's like, omnipresent like every time you're in that room you don't know it but it's there so I, I was just thinking about you know how much does does that actually influence it uh, influence our moods and our stress level and stuff like that so you know it may be worth considering or maybe I've, we're I've just thinking and trying to be you know sound engineers to the rescue saving the world or whatever it is like superman complex I've heard that that's one of the like health risks of lower income people that live in like huge high rise towers with lots of people is that the noise level actually makes you like more stressed and less healthy as a result. I forget where I was reading that. I wonder how much yeah. of it is a chicken and an egg kind of thing. Cause uh, obviously back background noise is going to cause stress, but then being stressed is going to make you notice things that you might have just sort of you know filtered out previously um 
and I'm sure there's there's probably like elements of both in any scenario. But I, I, I like I say, I can hear my neighbours talking through the wall. They can probably hear me talking now. Um, but I live right next to a park, and I, I I've started within the past two or three days. Uh, there's kids starting to go back to the park all day, uh, and I, I I could kill them. Um, but I wonder if I if I wasn't if I didn't have the stress of not working and being locked <laughs> in the house and you, you know if if that would bother me as much. I can speak probably for everybody now on this call that we have decided that social distancing has been a godsend for me. Right? <laughs> yeah, I'm not. I'm not actually going to kill anyone. <laughs> It, it's it, it no it just does make a good point like conceding and then in the live scenario of like because i always try to look at the big picture like yeah all of it i always look more on the audio but it's like when you're looking at some of these older venues and like your older like let's take the lighting system for example like i'm pretty sure there's some of those old old lights that should no longer be around that when you know the emmy pulls them up you hear this hum and you're like, oh God. Wait. But it's, it's, and, or like there's another venue I work where they got like, you know, they got some investors and got, they wanted to do an improvement. And me and the tech director were just throwing ideas around. I wasn't like, oh, we got to do this. But I was just like, oh man, maybe it would be nice some of this gear. They though chose, and it was nothing like official presentation and like just chit chatting. They went with uh, some new risers, which I said to them, like, no, that's, the much better solution because that because they weren't squeaky and also they weren't as heavy because these old risers like you moved on them they would make noise beyond the normal walking on them and i'm like dude that all that has now solved so many problems i don't have to worry about because i don't have to worry about like the floor mics picking it up the audience doesn't have to hear it it's just a whole lot less noise so it's just also figuring out like well what could be changed to reduce the noise that isn't you know, grand, obviously that's a grand example, but just thinking in here and there, like what could be done? Yeah, things like uh, ventilation systems in theaters, the, the theater I worked in was, it wasn't even, it wasn't air conditioned. It was just a, uh, it, it was just air blowers uh, and we would, the worst thing was, is the venue was originally built to be council, it was council owned, and it was originally built to be council run. So it was run by the local authorities. Uh, eventually, they got bored of the place and, and let it go to uh, a private tender. Uh, and then the company that I worked for until I left uh, got that contract. Um, now, because it was originally designed to be council run, all of the heating and ventilation systems were controlled from a council building off site, which, fair enough, was only a, yep, yeah, I made that phone, that face every day. Um, it was only a phone call away, but with them being council office workers, they were open 9 to 5, Monday to Friday. So when someone after 5 p.m. during the week or any day on a weekend said, can we get those blows turned off? The answer was, no, sorry. <laughs> oh, that is crazy. That, yeah, oh, yeah. that hurts me on so many levels. Yeah, it was, it was awful. And they weren't quiet. They weren't quiet at all. We that make... just remi yeah, sorry. Um, that just reminds me of a, shoot, I, I should find some photos, but um the main stage for all major events during an annual summer festival in the city capital in Slovenia is placed right in front of a giant lamp street lamp and that giant street lamp cannot be taken down because it's a part of a historical monument preservation act. So for years now, 
we've had all of the and and this is is like tv broadcasts and um you know like um central celebrations of like the national day of freedom whatever it is with president speaking on podiums and they are all talking directly into that street lamp because it just can't be moved and i'm like seriously there's a and it's it's i mean it's not um it's not rocket science it's like four bolts that you sort of unscrew remove the lamp put it back in like a month later and no no can't touch it so i feel you yeah. i feel you every year that we do that bloody stage with that bloody street lamp man yeah we had I mean, we had some companies where there would be a company manager or a production manager that was on the ball enough to uh, recognize that that was going to be an issue from the outset and ask for it to be turned off early um, you know, or, or if we if we knew it was going to be a quiet show uh, we would just phone in advance um, we had uh, Ian McKellen did a a tour for to celebrate his 80th birthday and ours was one of the venues in the UK that were picked uh, and I, I, I was I was doing sound for it, and it was the easiest gig I've ever done. It was uh, play walking music, turn walking music off, and that was it. No microphone, nothing. It was just Ian McKellen on stage talking. Uh, so it had to be, you know, it, it had to be turned off for that. Um, things like Woman in Black. I don't know if any of you have ever worked Woman in Black before, but that's... That's the kind of show where I've operated lights for it and you're replying on comms with a whisper in the auditorium because it's it's a cast of three if you include the the woman um, and none of them are miked and it's like 100% atmospheric, sort of like that's the whole show. Um so yeah, there's certain certain shows where we knew to just get it get it knocked off ahead of time. But there was a, there was a fair few like throughout my time there where someone would get to about six p.m. or or any time on a weekend and just say, "Is there any chance we can have that turned off?" And I'd just be like that. Do you guys ever have shows where uh, there are fans on stage that they insist point directly into the microphones? Because that seems to happen down here quite regularly. <laughs> I, I've, I've yet to have that. I, most of my gigs have been in the winter, so I've, knock on wood, haven't usually done that. But I think in the scenario where I did have a fan, I just politely asked them if I could either move it or... I haven't encountered that. Like, how would my only thought is maybe like low pass or find the frequency that's being the most annoying? But I man, I don't know. I mean, for me, it always just came down to like sweet talking until we could figure it out. But I, the venue that I got my start in here in Nashville, it's a bar. Like, we'll just say that. Um, they call themselves a venue, but it's a bar. And uh, it's super hot. It was kind of like, I don't know if you guys have ever been to Nashville, but like the, the like downtown bar music strip, all the bars have their like front windows open and the stages are right up against the windows. So when you're walking down the street, you're you're seeing the backs of the musicians basically through these open windows and it's super hot. And the bar that I worked at, <laughs> one day I came in and there were these big fans in the ceiling, roughly four feet from the mic, but directly directly pointing down and the manager was like isn't this great the bands are going to be so cool and I was like no you guys don't do this to me and we eventually just had to move them I mean eventually they died because everything in that building died from beer exposure but you know for a while it was a real battle every day people just don't think about it yeah yeah I've yeah, those battles are just the little things that aren't technically audio battles, but you have to then fight them is like, like, just reminding me of those battles, like when I was doing a production of Working, uh, the show was going pretty good. We were doing some shows, and then one night, there's the waitress scene, because for those who don't know, it's it's one of those, so long story short, Working is this was this book, 
and we're just basically this guy interviewed different working class people. So each, there's no overarching plot. The only theme is people doing working class jobs. So, you know, there's a stewardess, there's a delivery man, there's a fast food worker, list goes on and on. One of them's a waitress. She walks on <laughs> and it had been every week, every show, fine, except one night, she decided to put it right up against her, her Adam's apple. And I'm like, because like I had seen that whole show out, hit it, I see her, I hear it, I go crap, and I had to like shove it down. And I got into almost an argument with her. She was saying, well, why did I not sound good tonight? I'm like, you put your mic in the wrong spot. And she's like, oh no, it was right. I'm like, I kind of just said in a nice way, just we'll make sure it's in the right place next time. But I'm like, no, it's the scenes. I hadn't changed the scene. So if I got that sound, that meant something on your end was wrong, but it's like, so I kind of went on to a little rant, but it's like, yeah, there's so many sounds. You always have to worry about that. I have nothing to do with audio. Like there's a fog machine in the show. You're like, uh-oh. Yeah, that snake hiss that comes out of nowhere. <laughs> yep. Oh, I think I think I've got to get rolling, guys. My dog needs that walk. <laughs> it's all good. I am actually was going to try and find a good point to end this. Um, I Thank you all for coming. Leave yeah. My- more and tell your fellow friends on Ghost 11 or people you met on the live sound summit of it. This is open to those people as well. So this has been amazing. I had a great time. Liam, you came in just as I'm doing the thank yous. <laughs> ah, so, cool. Yeah, so pretty didn't, much. Didn't miss anything. Then. <laughs> no, didn't miss too, too much. I'm just showing pain, saying war stories at this point. But again, thank you, everybody. I am now going to end the recording. Mm-hmm. <laughs>